Hey there, folks. Welcome to Spectrum Pulse. You talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And this was my plan as the last week for On the Pulse in 2020. But turns out it won't be because I had albums that I still wanted to cover for this year that did not align with the Patreon requests I got. So to handle those, there's going to be one more episode coming at a later date. But until then, this is the last of said Patreon requests. So let's get On the Pulse. So we got seven albums on the docket. Let's first mention from Taylor Swift, Evermore. Yes, I know, wherever you stray, I follow. I'm begging for you to take my hand, wreck my plans, that's my man. Already had a fair amount to say on this one that inflamed many a Taylor Swift fan, if the sub loss is anything to go by. But I do think the album is actually quite good, and will play well especially to fans of Red, but it's not quite as revelatory as folklore for me, and doesn't quite delve as deeply as it could, especially as some consistent issues are lingering from the previous project that holds it back from greatness. Still good though, so solid 7 out of 10, it's worth hearing, but I might personally be ready for a break for Taylor Swift and I get the impression that she might be heading on one pretty soon. We'll have to see. Next up from Video Age, Pleasure. Well, this is some 80s inspired synth pop, all right? And yet the odd thing with Video Age is that on their first two albums, they really struggled a bit to commit to a style. The clash of Sophistapop with some obvious and wonky aerial pink influences led to a bit of a clash I wish was more interesting or impactful, especially given the vocals and writing were neither to match some otherwise alright hooks. So okay, third album, do things improve? Honestly, not really, because instead of punching up the vocals or the hook or the content, the group chose to slide even further towards the sort of late 80s synth schmaltz, the sort that would become emblematic of chintzy commercials and the most limp and forgettable material of that decade and the 90s. Now look, Ariel Pink took inspiration from these tones too, but he added grimy texture across the board that gave the material some character that this just does not have, especially with how frail and wispy the vocals sound here, even multi-tracked. Instead, the material sounds competent in imitating that retro vibe with the splashy synths and the soft rock grooves, but it never goes beyond that, especially in the writing where the material is meandering and wistful yearning for finding or recovering love described with the sort of bare and underweight poetry and delivery that can't sell a shred of real passion. And don't even get me started about their attempts at a bouncy 80s dance groove that I would call a parody if I thought anything here was remotely funny, with the song Comic Relief being painful evidence of that, but at least it's better than the weird pettiness that was leaking through that can't be. Coupled with the smattering of questionable drum machine integrations into the spiky attempts at some synth funk, the best thing I can say about this is that it's short enough to not consume a lot of attention. But let's be blunt here, if it wasn't for the vaporwave, hypnagogic pop fascination that eats up these tones, there would be no reason to care about this. And while the textures generally fit the mold, there's nothing else that really recommend it beyond that. That. Light 5 out of 10, even if you like these tones, you've probably heard this done better somewhere else. Next up from Blackfield, for the music. Okay, I can reiterate my usual spiel against side projects, but Blackfield is a bit of an odd case, specifically because of the duo behind it. Israeli singer-songwriter Aviv Geffen and Porcupine Tree frontman Stephen Wilson. Not quite as heavy or openly prog as Porcupine Tree was, Blackfield was originally framed as a lighter, poppier fit for everyone involved, which might have been a fine if a little undercooked and bland idea in the 2000s, but given that Stephen Wilson started making progressive pop pop rock solo in the 2010s, I wondered what real purpose this diversion served beyond the ever-increasing number of Steven Wilson's side projects. Well, after listening to this, it really feels like it's forgiving Aviv Geffen a paycheck, because it's a lot more of his venture in terms of more basic compositions, soft focus production, and featuring a lot more of his vocals overall, which is not really a compliment, because his throatier, more nasal delivery is not flattering to these mixes whatsoever. But the larger problem is that it's just tepid as all hell. Blackfield has always been pegged as pretty good at 
best, but this album is living down to all the milk toast pejoratives you could throw at this project in the mid 2000s, revealing underwritten, overpolished, melodically stale, and way too close to adult alternative, but with less organic flavor. And the content also really does not help matters here. A lot of undercooked musician on the road flourishes, some weirdly detached relationship angst, and some bizarrely graphic scenes on songs like Garden of Sin that's also pretty bleak and not supported by the arrangement whatsoever. Look, overall, even though I'm a Steven Wilson fan, this is pretty damn generic and forgettable. Five out of 10, let's move on. Next up from Second in Command, Enigma. All right, second Second in Command project I'm covering this year. I know for a fact that the artist watched my review and was taking notes on what, in my opinion, felt like a very amateur effort, especially on the production end. So I was genuinely curious whether or not there would be an improvement in the turnaround. And overall, I think there is, although I can still identify plenty that could be further expanded. For one, there is still a notable difference in audio quality between his vocals and those of his guests, although I will say Cosmos throatier tones. They sound great against that simmering bass on Velvet. It's probably the best instrumental and hook that Second has ever pulled together. Might be his best song to date. And even within some songs, his punch-ins can sound pretty obvious. And while he drowns out a lot of his sung vocals and a lot of auto-tune for more of a Kid Cudi-esque trap timbre, especially when he's in his lower register, I do think some of the mixes are a little bit too spare to flatter it all that well. Especially with the brittle percussion and some thin creaking melodies. Maybe more backing vocals would help flesh this out, but most of this makes me think that the arrangements just need a little more development, a little bit thicker atmospheric texture, especially for the sort of songs that he's making that are more moody, and especially on the more tuneful cuts, when he's not just gonna cut loose and spit. And even there, I do wish some of the bangers hit with a little bit more punch in order to counterbalance the off-kilter tunes. Now, the biggest improvement for me seems to have come in a lot of the content, where not only does Second's choice of wordplay feel a fair bit less corny, but we also get a somewhat self-contained loose narrative about falling way too hard for a girl that spirals into ugly obsession when things turn sour. And that adds some interesting context to the first half of the project, where he is spitting a lot more aggressively and shows exactly how that kind of persona could badly fumble such a relationship if he is a little bit too possessive, which makes me wish that there is that added step to truly dissect what would come next. The album kind of ends at a point of presumptive, jealous rage, and it feels a little bit incomplete in its angst as a result. You don't get to a deeper conclusion, and you can tell on certain songs he's definitely trying to have his cake and eat it as well, in more ways than one, and that will not rub everyone the right way. Overall, I do think for what it is, I hear an improvement, but I also think uh, before expanding and refining the raw technical pieces, it could lead to a stronger project, so strong 5 out of 10, not bad at all in terms of trap-inspired hip-hop, if you prefer the more bare-bones Josh A. adjacent side of things, ah, what the hell, give it a listen. Next up from Achiko Eoba, Adan no Kaze. <laughs> Can I claim to be ahead of the curve when I was covering a Chico Aoba on Instagram at Spectrum Pulse before the internet lost their mind over this album? She's an artist who's been on my radar for a little bit as someone who's played to serene acoustic chamber folk with a warm, winsome tone that reminded me a lot of Joanna Newsom. So I actually put in some work to check out her full back catalog and, uh, well, this is one of those projects where the fact I don't speak Japanese might have me sell this a little short. Because while I think the textures are organic, and warm and often beautifully composed, her work does tend to run together a little bit. And if I was able to capture the nuances of her writing more clearly, I might be picking up on more and appreciating more here. That said, if you want a quick primer, her 2012 album, Utabiko, it's pretty damn terrific. 2013's O is probably her most accessible and assured project with some beautiful field recordings integrated into her mix. And 2018's QP followed in a similar, more developed sound. So where does 2020 take her? 
here? Well, for one, it's the most developed and ornamental Aoba's music has ever sounded. Yes, there's still a foundation and some distinctive acoustic textures, but along with the field recordings, there's now strings and flutes, chimes and harps, and even some electric guitar in order to further develop the blissful, fluttering tones. And of course, it sounds wonderfully organic and rich, and Aoba's hush but striking vocals complement these mixes beautifully, and just how well the strings will rise out of the mix to complement the acoustic work on cuts like Easter Lily and Dawn in the Adan. But that being said, I do have some gripes with this. The first being is that for as varied as this album feels, it can still run a little bit long and slide into the background. Yes, I know it leans ambient, and it's all about that wondrous, enveloping, natural experience with a distinctly aquatic timbre on a few songs, but in points can feel a little bit too sedate, and I wish I had more of a grasp on the content to really grab me more. I found translations of a fair few songs here, but while there is much implied in the otherworldly beauty of the poetry, the abstraction can leave me feeling a little cold, which it might reflect the mix in comparison with previous Achiko Aoba albums, but doesn't hold me in the same way. Again, I am assuming that I am missing plenty because I don't speak Japanese here, but that's also the risk that comes with this brand of folk. Even an album that can lean on atmosphere so effectively, if I don't grasp the lyrics, it might not click fully. As such, very strong 7 out of 10, very good, extremely pretty, absolutely the sort of soothing music that'll rule for the new age scene, but I'm always a little bit hit and miss with that scene, so take it as you will. Next up from Foster the People, in the darkest of nights, let the birds sing. It has been astonishingly easy for me to forget about Foster the People when they're not releasing projects and consistently underwhelming me to the fury of their bewildering number of fans. I guess because Pumped Up Kicks got a little bit ahead of every single advertising company grabbing middle-of-the-road indie rock that this band somehow escapes that branding, despite really epitomizing the mildest form of quirkiness that fits that brand and the fact they've always been on a major label. Well, to my surprise, 2020 was a year that shook up this band as after Sacred Hearts Club underperformed in 2017 and their string of singles kind of went nowhere, they actually got dropped, I mean departed from Columbia and released this EP independently. Which might be why there's been so very little buzz I've seen around it. Which, okay look, I have never been a Foss of the People fan, Still true with this, but I do think there's a little bit more color and interesting things going on here, even if I don't precisely think it's good. Mark Foster's voice bending from a passable lower register to all manner of annoying falsetto to a weirdly theatrical Bowie impersonation on Cadillac. I mean, it's frustrating enough as it is, but then you have the band attempting a weird blend of wonky psychedelic rock, flashes of disco, and really way too much Tame Impala worship without Kevin Parker's knack for blending over the more gooey textures. And even if I think the bass lines are really good, and they are, a lot of the percussion feels way too programmed to lend the album the retro flavor that it very clearly desires. Yeah, the Beach Boys-esque harmonies on Walk With A Big Stick, they are really good, and I actually found myself kind of vibing with the auto-tune and electro-disco on the things we do, but even the moments that I like are juxtaposed with some really messy compositions and textures that don't flatter them without great transitions to say nothing of that omnipresent hand clap. And it doesn't help that the writing's not all that good either. Either. A lot of love songs half trying to play a figure with a little bit more swagger than Mark Foster than can convincingly sell, which is why a lot of the more wistful moments would have had some charm if there was a bit more character to the poetry. I do think Lamb's Wool stands out for being about love of family from beyond the grave, but it feels tenuous to tie it in with the rest of the love songs here, and I'm not really sure the whole spectral vibe on a few songs really clicks. Really, my biggest issue with these songs is that they're just too messy in order to punch all that hard, but not so messy that they aren't just forgettable. And at this point, this band really is forgettable. Light 5 out of 10. Again, they've never really been for me. But even then, I feel like I'm being generous. But when we're talking about something that's spectral, finally from the avalanches, we will always love you. You know, 
the benefit of being one of the most acclaimed electronic and plunderphonics acts long term is that you can drop an album whenever the hell you want with a healthy lead up past the point where the majority of critics have made their year end list. But if you're chasing a specific mood or sound or even season, you can just do it. And that's the suspicion I've had with the Avalanches here. With a new album coming only four years after their last one, given previously it had taken 16 years since their debut, but also digging into their sound, the content and overall feel of this project. Well, you know what? Given how every Avalanches project has always sounded a little bit outside of time, I'm not sure there's a time or place that makes more sense for this album than December of 2020. And on the surface, it might not like seem like that, because about half the album seems to circle around imagery and iconography about space and reaching out into the cosmos. They literally sampled a Golden Voyager record, and the closing track is a Morse code snippet of the Arecibo message converted into MIDI that was written by Frank Drake and Carl Sagan. And that's all cool! I really love music on the spacier side, and the crackling of old samples and records does a lot to reinforce that low-key retro futurism, but that's only about half the album, and not quite where the emotional core lands, because the other half is crossing a far greater distance between life and death, and that leads to moments like Nick Jones trying to reach late Karen Carpenter, or Denzel Curry blasting through 10 years of his life in his verse as his success has been echoed by personal tragedy that he's still dealing with, or how in the final third, the Avalanche has pulled a mother of all gut punches and have Karen O, Pink Silfu, and Rivers Cuomo of all people reference the late David Berman. And I didn't even really have the chance to get into Purple Mountains and that got to me hard, god damn. And yet that doesn't even surprise me. A lot of this album is about trying to extend love from a distance. And if you integrate sleigh bells into so many of these organic sampled grooves that likely intentionally trigger holiday reminiscence and also mourning for those lost in 2020. I mean, fuck. That's not even getting into one of the most inspired cuts is where Kurt Vile and Wayne Coyne team up on synthesizing these themes on Gold Sky and it's absolutely beautiful. Why they haven't worked together before now? My God, that sounds great. And as such, there is a part of me that feels like the album has to be this sprawling and expansive to do both themes justice. Sure, the most cynical part of me thinks that uh, certain passages are chasing the magic of Frank Sinatra again, but then the album just damn near gets there, and it's just that powerful, especially on the back half. Just not all the way through. And while the production is colorful and rich, and the performances are great across the board, there is a part of me that knows that this album is leaning on emotionality because the content in and of itself and the poetry is not drilling deeper. But again, it's hard for me to care when it works this well, especially in this time of year especially in December of 2020. So here's what I'm gonna do. Extremely strong 7 out of 10. The best moments, they are in contention with the best of 2020. And while I can get into the atmosphere around this, I can also see how it can just be too much in so many different ways. Even still, phenomenal surprise for the end of the year in the best way possible. You wanna hear it and you should, give it a chance. Check it out. So yeah, thanks a lot for watching. You like to like and subscribe, I'd be more than grateful. As I did say, I've got one more episode of On the Pulse coming. I've also got a movie review that I gotta get out at some point. Then I got a special video I'm gonna put out surrounding the state of affairs for this channel going into 2021, plus the year end list, all five regular videos. Stay tuned for that, it's gonna be long. But hey, until then, I'd be happy to have you guys around. And if you guys actually will have any comments or suggestions on how I can improve things, comments down there. I'm sure I said something controversial. But beyond that, if you want to help contribute to this channel or maybe have some impact on my schedule in the upcoming year, link to my Patreon is right over there. Please under no feel no obligation to contribute here. I will be fine and it's tough times out there for everybody. But if you want to, the option's available. But until then, I'm Mark. You're watching On The Pulse on Spectrum Pulse. And I'll see you next time.